Yes, I am very silly tonight, if you have not yet seen. I am silly tonight, but I am here. Hello, everyone. Hi, everybody. I am here. Yes, I am. It is late. And I don't know how it got to be so late so fast, because I actually came up here at a decent hour, but then... The studying got long and got interesting and deep. And before I knew it, now it's this time. What? How did it get to be this late? That's okay. I am here and going to bed right after here, I promise you. So, hello, everyone. We are going to get started shortly. Uh, let's see. <laughs> uh, we will give it about 30 more seconds, guys, before we get started. Someone is watching. Somebody is watching. Let's see. Oh, hello. Yay. Long time no see. Hi, sweetie. Nice to have you watching. I am going to go ahead and get started. We are on 1 Samuel, trucking through the Old Testament. Yes, we are. We are on chapter 11. We ended 1 Samuel talking about um, uh, Saul anointing Samuel as, I'm sorry, Samuel anointing Saul as king. Um, in chapter 10, um, we talked about how, um, he gave, um, saw several things that were going to happen for him to look for. One of those things was your, the spirit of the Lord is going to come on you while you're in the presence. Hi, Tanya. While you are in the presence of, uh, prophets and you're going to prophesy. Um, and so that happened, um, and then, you know, Samuel actually anoints Saul as king, um, tells him who he is, and then he reminds the people, y'all say y'all wanted a king, remember all these, all of this is going to happen, um, and come with this king, with this thing you said you wanted, please remember this is what comes with that, right? Which I think is a message in itself. Um, I say to, to all, you know, people who want to get married, right? Um, you say you want this, but remember, this is what comes with that. I think that, you know, when Bishop sits down and counsels married couples, he should remind them how much they wanted to be married in the first place. And then remember, this is what comes with that, right? Um, so often we have it set up in our minds how a thing should be. Um, but God has already told us, right, that marriage is work, Um um, that raising children are work, that, you know, following a dream job is work, right? But when we get into the work of it, um, we forget that this is what comes with that, right? We only want to see the, the glorious parts of, um, you know, marriage or the glorious parts of mother or fatherhood or the glorious parts of, you know, um, uh, working uh, an important job, but remember, this is what comes with that, right? So all of that might be true. Um, not negating any of that, but understand this is what comes with that. Um, and so Israel wanted a king, and so Samuel did a really good job of reminding them, so you want a king like all the nations, other nations have a king, but remember, this is what comes with that. Um, thank you, Lord. That was a good, quick word. I was not expecting, but thank you, Lord, uh, because that that's that's awesome. Hi, Marilyn. Hi, Cliff. Um, so remember when you're asking God 
for things. Maybe we should step back and say, wait, wait, let me uh, count up the cost. Let me see what comes with that before I ask for this. That might be a good practice, right? Let me see what comes with that before I ask for this, right? Uh, because it may be some small print that you didn't read. So make sure you take time to read the entire thing, including the small print, so you will know uh, that this is what comes with that. Um, and so that's how we kind of ended yesterday. And it actually ended with um, Saul, you know, most of the people accepted him, but then it was a small band of people that was like, mm, well, you want us to follow who? Really? Why should we be following him? And you know, it's always, the, it always is somebody, somebody in the crowd. Um, that wants to question, right? Uh, but then we open up in chapter 11, um, and we open up um, with uh, uh, being in Jabesh Gilead, and um, the Ebonites had actually besieged Jabesh Gilead. And besieging, and I, we talked about this before, is when the enemy just surrounds you, so nothing could come in, nothing could go out. Um, and so they were being besieged. And basically that was like the first step of we about to conquer you. We about to take you over, right? So the first step of that was for them to just surround you with their army. Nothing could come in, nothing could go out. And eventually you would run out of supplies, right? Uh, especially in those days and times, uh, no imports, no exports, right? Um, and so eventually you're going to, there's only so much food that you can grow. There's only... Um, uh, uh, so many things, right, um, that you can get in and out before you start having need of uh, getting past where you have been besieged. So here are the Ammonites have uh, besieged them, and Nahash, their king at the time, basically says, we about to take y'all over. What y'all going to do? Um, and so uh, the leaders actually um, decided... We're going to ask, you know, if we can make a treaty, right? So they didn't see God. They didn't pray. They didn't say, Lord, help us. Um, they said, okay, let's see if we can make a treaty. So they went to Nahash to try to make a treaty. And Nahash said, yeah, we'll, we can make a treaty. Um, we still going to take y'all over. Um, and we're going to, like, you know, put out your right eye <laughs> um, of all men, right? We're going to put out your right eye. Pretty much crippling them from being able to fight in the future because, um, if you know anything about fighting, you need your full peripheral, right? If you really go to fight a uh, hand to hand combat. Um, and so, uh, basically Nahash is like, what are y'all going to do? And Jabash Gilead said, you know what? We'll surrender. Just give us seven days to see if we, if there is somebody that will rise up and help us. And if nobody rises up in seven days, um, then, you know, do what you will. You're going to, you're going to, you know, I guess it's better than being dead, Right. <laughs> Um, having one eye is better than being dead. Isn't that just like the enemy? I mean, really think about it. Sometimes um, the enemy tricks us into giving up just a little bit, thinking, oh, we'll just give up this little bit, uh, but we don't know it's crippling us for the fight later. Uh -huh. So, you know, the enemy takes just a little, but the little he takes is going to make it harder for us to fight in the future, right? And so there's a method to the madness. And we don't see it at the time. We're like, well, I'll just give up this little bit right here um, just so that I can be peaceful in the moment, right? Instead of fighting to keep everything, we give up a little. And the next thing we know, uh, when we are ready to fight, we don't have it in us to fight because of the little that we have already given up. So you got to keep in mind, people, don't give up anything to the devil. Don't give up nothing to don't compromise anything to the enemy no he cannot guide out your white eye right no you can't give up this at all because giving a little bit is going to prevent you from winning in the end so don't give it up don't give it up don't give it up all right um and so um uh, um uh, uh the people of jabesh gilead just send messengers out to all of israel um and, and basically telling them these people are about to take us over and all the men about to run, walk around with a patch on their eye because we ain't got nobody that can save us, right? Now, remember that Saul was anointed king in chapter 10. In, in the previous chapter, he was anointed king, but Saul went home. After he was anointed king, he had like a few people who followed him, like some valiant men 
Like, what we gonna do? What we gonna do? He was like, I don't know what y'all gonna do, but I'm about to go home and fire my daddy's farm animals like I've been doing, right? I mean, he goes home and like continues on with his life. Like this big thing didn't just happen. Like you weren't just anointed king of like a nation, right? He's like, yeah, yeah, I don't really see what I'm supposed to do yet. I don't have like a motto. Um, nobody has like a king book. For me to read, I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing. So I'm just going to go back to what I was doing, right? And in some sense, it's like, okay, uh-oh, the mic fell, guys. Um, okay, sorry about that. Some kind of way, because the mic was freezing, it caused the video to stop working. So hopefully everything is back working normally now. Um, and I do apologize, then, so don't go anywhere. Hopefully you're still there and nobody went anywhere. Um, but I was saying, um, um, in some sense, what Saul did, you can kind of understand because he hadn't been given clear instructions from God. He didn't know what to do. Um, you know, he was just like anointed king. And so he just went back to doing whatever he was doing beforehand. You know, I guess in his mind, I'll just, you know, when they need a king, they'll come get me, right? which is kind of what they were doing before that. Um, uh, it was kind of what they had been doing before that, um, you know, with the judges. When they needed somebody, they would go get them. They didn't really know how kings work because they never had one. But in another sense, it's like, but you, you ain't going to stand up as king. They didn't even respect him as king. They didn't, like, run to tell him first. He just happened to be walking by and saw everybody crying. Like, what y'all crying about? It's like, oh, they about to kill us, right? Uh, but then it says, the Spirit of the Lord came on him. And when the Spirit of the Lord came upon him, he got angry. He was like, what? They go, what? Our right eyes? No, we're not going to do that. We're not having that. And so the Spirit of God came on him, and he actually um, started burning with anger he cut up an oxen, sent it to all the tribes and said, this is going to happen to all y'all oxen if y'all don't step up and help me. And because of that, he was able to get 300,000, right, to come out and help him. So he had a huge army to come out and help him. Um, and, of course, they defeated the Ammonites. And then now they're feeling cocky, right? So the army is like, where are them men that said they would never follow you? We want those men to come on out here and say that now, right? Um, but Saul was like, no, it's not going to be no killing today. Let those men go. All is well, right? Um, but Samuel, who is very smart, is like, okay, so now that the people see what he can do and are really respecting him as king because he has led them into a battle, um, listen to what Samuel does in verse 14 of chapter 11. Then Samuel said to the people, come, let us go to Gilgad and there renew the kingship. So all the people went to Gilgad and made Saul king in the presence of the Lord. There they sacrificed fellowship offerings before the Lord and Saul and all the Israelites held a great celebration. So um, Samuel is like, Let, let's take this as an opportunity to renew the kingship so that everybody remembers this is your king that led you into war, right? So now he is officially, officially the king. Um, and um, in the next chapter, chapter 12, Samuel kind of just begins to talk to the people. And sort of, um, it's sort of like um, um, a transitional stage. Because remember, Samuel was the last judge. Uh, you know, we had uh, the 12 judges that we had in the book of Judges. And then we had um, Eli at the beginning of uh, 1 Samuel. And then we transitioned to Samuel, who has been a judge all his life. Remember, he was raised in the temple. So he's been a judge all his life. And um, he actually dies still being a judge, right? Um, but he's transitioning uh, some of his power over to the king. Now that there is a king, he wants to make sure that the people respect the king as the king. And I think he actually wants to separate himself in some ways from some of the things that Saul does. Um, which we will see shortly. And so he gives this big speech in chapter 12 um, where he constantly is asking them, did I do anything wrong? Have I ever stolen from you? Have I ever treated you wrong? Have I ever told you anything that wasn't true? Um, so he's like making the people 
uh, see who he is and who he's been in their life. Um, and then he says, let me tell you about why it's wrong for y'all to ask for a king in the first place, right? And so he's telling the people uh, why they shouldn't have asked for a king. He goes through sort of the story of Israel um, from the time they enter Egypt up until now. And it's basically saying, God was your king. Why did you ask for a king? God was your king. But he says, um, and this is important, um, in verse 14, uh, basically this is a nevertheless statement, right? So like, nevertheless, okay, we're here. Uh, verse 14 says, if you fear the Lord and serve and obey him and do not rebel against his commands, and if you, if both you and the king who reigns over you follow the Lord your God, good, <laughs> right? I'm going to read that one again. It says, if you fear the Lord and serve and obey him and do not rebel against his commands, and if both you and the king who reigns over you follows the Lord your God, good. But how many you know it's not going to stay there, right? Because there's a but. But if you do not obey the Lord and if you rebel against his commands, his hand will be against you as it was against your ancestors. And so... Um, Samuel is letting them know, look, you asked for a king, but now you're going to be held responsible for what that king does, right? So you and the king have to make sure that y'all stay um, in contact with uh, the Lord, that y'all follow him, that you're obedient to him. You and the king. And he keeps saying you and the king because now you got this king over you. So it could be like the all, all of Israel want to do the right thing. But if the king wants to do the wrong thing, then the king leads them into the wrong thing. You and the king, right? Um, and so uh, finally the people see um, that they have done a bad thing by asking for a king. It's taking them all this time. Um, and so they repent and call on the Lord. Um, and in verse 19, it says, the people all said to Samuel, pray to the Lord, your God, which was funny to me. Pray to the Lord, your God. Wait, this ain't your God too. Not pray to the Lord, our God, but pray to the Lord, your God. It's almost like we ain't sure of the God we praying for. I mean, praying to is the right God, but pray to your God, right? Uh, which shows you the distance of the relationship that the, uh, children of Israel had with God himself. But they say, Pray to the Lord your God for your service so that we will not die. For we have added to all our other sins the evil of asking for a king. So they finally admit that it was evil for them to ask for a king. Um, basically, Samuel answers and says, yes, you've done this, but God is merciful. So don't let all, uh, um, you know, uh, be thrown out the window because God is a merciful God. Um, just don't start, you know serving idols don't serve the bells don't serve asherah make sure that you follow god and then this is our memory verse in verse 24 so chapter 12 verse 24 chapter 12 verse 24 says but be sure to fear the lord and serve him faithfully with all your heart consider what great things he has done for you i'm gonna say it again chapter 12 verse 24 but be sure to fear the lord and serve him faithfully with all your heart consider what great things he has done for you um and so basically um samuel is telling them look just don't forget where you come from right don't forget where you come from you got a king that's what you wanted but don't forget where you come from. Still fear the Lord. Don't think they all is well just because you got a king. Still fear the Lord and follow his commands. Do what the Lord tells you to do. And then <coughs> if you follow him faithfully with all your heart, um, considering the great things that he has done for you, then you'll receive the blessings of the Lord, right? Um but he admonishes them, remember where you come from. Remember what God has already done. Remember how God has already lifted you up. Remember all of the blessings that God has already given you. And that's what we need to do even as children of God. Now, we need to make sure that we follow this scripture, that we be sure 
to fear the Lord. Think about yourself when you're hearing it now. Be sure that you fear the Lord and that you serve him faithfully with all of your heart. Consider what great things he has done for you. And a lot of times when we're in the middle of a battle, in the middle of a struggle, in the middle of going through, we're in the middle of, I can't see my way out of this, no way, no how. We forget how many times we have been in that exact situation before where God was the only person that can get us out. And at the time, we didn't see how God was going to do it, but God, he got us out, but God, he delivered us, but God, he made a way out of no way. We got to remember and consider what great things he's already done for us. So when you find yourself depressed and you find yourself down, you find yourself angry, you find yourself not understanding, um, you know, where you are, it, it looks like everyone's walked away from you. It looks like you have nothing or that you're going nowhere or whatever the feeling is. You have to remember where God brought you from last time. Don't forget your deliverances. Don't forget your deliverances. In uh, the book of Deuteronomy, um, the Lord repeatedly told Israel's, Israel not to forget to remember. And it's a funny statement, right? Don't forget to remember, right? But it is true. You can forget to remember. You, you didn't forget what happened. You didn't forget that you were delivered. You didn't forget that you were set free. You didn't forget that God brought you out. You didn't forget that God made a way, but you forgot to remember it in the time that you needed to remember it the most. Don't forget to remember. That is how you get through your, your tough times, through uh, the times that seem like you're not going to make it through, through situations where it seems like this is it, uh, <laughs> Uh, West Sanford and son, Fred on Sanford and son, like, uh, this is it. This is the big one. Elizabeth, I'm coming, right? It feels like that, right? But if you remember, you know what? God got me through something similar to this last time. You know what? God got me through something worse than this last time. I know I have scenarios in my life. Um, when I say, you know what? I've been through much worse than this. Why am I tripping? Sometimes you got to talk to yourself. Why, Watrice, are you going through all of this when you already know God's got a way? He has already made a way out. You just have not found it yet. So why are, you know, that's, I believe that's what uh, David was thinking when he said, why so downcast? Oh, my soul, put my trust in God, right? Why am I so down? Why, why, why? I can put my hope, my trust in God because I know that God will bring me out. And so as we continue on um, in chapter 13, uh, we come to uh, talking about Saul uh, even more. And so Saul is leading. He is officially king. He's actually developed an army now. He has um, uh, before every time that they went to war against someone, they had to call everybody to Mizpah. Right. And so everybody, it was, you know, they would send word to all the camps and then uh, uh, fighting men from all the camps would be called to Mizpah and they would organize there and then they would go out, you know, uh, conduct the war and then everybody would go home. But now he has established an army, which is one of the things that Saul told them. I'm sorry, that Samuel told them that the king would do. He would establish an army. He's going to take your sons from you. No longer are they going to gather and miss, but then go home. But now this is going to be an army. They're going to stay and they're going to protect the king. And they're going to be army that just um, are, are always there ready to fight. And so he chose 3,000 men um, who were just going to be a part of this army. 2,000 um, um, in one place and 1,000 in another place and uh, so he's uh, starting to do this. And um, and so they were still fighting against the Philistines. And, and, and really the Philistines have um, had them under siege um, off and on for a great number of years. And we're going to see, constantly see it coming back and back to the Philistines. So they're still fighting the Philistines. And so by this time, Jonathan, um, Jonathan uh, Saul's son, has come onto the scene. And we can see what a brave uh, army a uh, go-getter kind of son that Saul really has in Jonathan. And Jonathan is a beautiful story of, um, of the son of a king, 
um, who actually just was fearless, right? And so Jonathan is like basically um, taunting the Philistines and he goes up and attacks um, some of them at Geba and really just starts a, 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 a kind of war thing going on. Um, and so all the Philistines raise up like, oh, y'all ready to fight, right? Y'all ready to fight, right? Um, but the Israelites are scared. They are scared. They have gotten scared. And so they start to scatter. Um, and, um, you know, they're starting, the Bible says they start to scatter so much that some of them even run across the, the Jordan um, to hide over, you remember, um, don't forget now, remember Reuben, um, Gad, and the half tribe of Manasseh that stayed on the other side of the Jordan. Well, some of the Israelite fight men had gotten, he started with 3,000, remember? Some of them had gotten so scared that they ran over on the other side of the Jordan. Like, you know what? I'm just going to stay over here till y'all figure that out. Um, and tell my wife, I, you know, well, you know what? Don't tell her nothing. Just let her think I'm fighting. Let her think I'm fighting. But I'm going to be over here on the other side of the Jordan, you know, just visiting our family members over on the other side of the Jordan till y'all figure that out, right? Um, but when it all came down to it, um, Saul ended up with like just 600 men because everyone else was scared. They were scattering. They were running back to their homes or running to hide in caves or running on the other side of the Jordan. And so Saul was getting restless because he had been waiting for uh, Samuel to come and offer uh, sacrifice to the Lord on their behalf to tell him whether he was supposed to pursue or not, right? Um, and so he's waiting for Samuel to do this. Samuel told him he would be there in seven days, but on the seventh day, Samuel still wasn't there. So Saul took it upon himself to say, well, Samuel's not coming. I'll just go ahead and offer this offering to the Lord myself. I'll just do it, right? And uh, listen to what it says here in verse eight of chapter 13. He waited seven days, the time set by Samuel, but Samuel did not come to Gilgad, and Saul's men began to scatter. So he said, bring me the burnt offering and the fellowship offerings. And Saul offered up the burnt offering. Just as he finished making the offering, Samuel arrived and Saul went out to greet him. What have you done? asked Samuel. Saul replied, when I saw that the men were scattering and that you did not come at the set time and that the Philistines were assembling at Michmash, I thought now the Philistines will come down against me at Gilgad and I have not sought the Lord's favor. So I felt compelled to offer the burnt offering. Anybody ever felt compelled to sin? Because that's ba basically what he said. I, I felt compelled to sin. I felt compelled. I, I wrote this little note um, in my Bible when I was reading it because I write down my thoughts. I write all over my Bible, guys. And so I was writing down my thoughts at the time um, and I put compelling feelings can equate to disobedient actions. I'll read it again. Compelling feelings can equate to disobedient actions. Look, when it comes down to God's word and your feelings you better always default to God's word. Your feelings will get you in trouble. And I'm telling you, they can be compelling feelings. I mean, you can feel like it's the right thing to do. But when it's all said and done, if that's not what God said, it doesn't matter how you feel. You better do what God says. The Bible says there is a way that seems right unto a man, but the ends thereof is the way of death. It's going to always be a compelling feeling that is trying to get you to do everything else but obey God. But when it's all said and done, you got to make sure that the word is settled in your heart, settled in your heart. That's why the Bible tells us to make sure it is rooted in our hearts because if it's not then your feeling will be able to take over what the word of god should be in your life in other words you will go to your feelings instead of the word of god the old saints used to say it this way you better make sure your anchor holds and grips 
the solid rock, right? Make sure your anchor holds and grips the solid rock. And um, I talked about this anchor experience even before, how you got to make sure that you are so anchored in the word of the Lord that even if you're, uh, the purpose of an anchor is not to make it so the ship don't go nowhere, right? The purpose of the anchor is to make sure that if the ship drifts, that it only drifts so far, that it's only going to go so far and that it remembers where it's anchored to, right? You may drift, but you better make sure that your anchor is somewhere so that you don't drift away, right? Because you don't want to drift away. You want to make sure your anchor holds and grips the solid rock. And so here, Saul has disobeyed. He has done the offering himself. I mean, he has taken, I mean, it's a spirit of pride in here. How dare you think that you could just do the job of a priest, right? You the king, nowhere in your ordination were you ordained as a priest. But how dare you minimize the job of a priest so much that you feel like, Shh, he ain't here. I can just do it, right? You got to be careful because God puts people in places for reasons, right? Um, and, and just bringing this up to date a little bit, sometimes people do this. I could do that. I mean, we don't need no bishop to do that. We don't need no pastor to do that. We don't need a minister to do that. I'm, shh, I can, anybody can pray, right? You better be careful that you don't have the spirit of Saul when you're doing this. Just because you're impatient at how long it's taking uh, someone else to do what they have been ordained by God to do. Um, and now you have just taken it upon yourself to say, oh, I can do that. I mean, that ain't nothing what they do anyway. That's sort of the attitude he was doing it in. Like, this is taking too long. And why do we need him anyway? Right? I mean, he just... You know, Samuel, the prophet, why, why we need him anyway? Um, and so because of that, he minimized the role that God had put Samuel in. He minimized God's ordained place for Samuel and took it upon himself to be able to do what God had ordained Samuel to do. I'm telling you, always check yourself. Make sure you don't have the spirit of Saul. And so what did Samuel say? Samuel said, you have done a foolish thing. Verse 13, Samuel said, you have not kept the command the Lord your God gave you. If you had, he would have established your kingdom over Israel for all time. But now your kingdom will not endure. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart and appointed him ruler over his people. Because you have not kept the Lord's command. So here, um, you know, Saul is pleading and God's like, I don't know, already went on to the replacement. Mm -hmm. Replacement is already happening. I've already gone on to the replacement, right? Um, we've got to make sure um, that, you know, we're, we're doing the will of God uh, because there are replacements. Mm -hmm. There are people who will if we won't. There are people that will stand up when we sit down. There's people whose mouths will open when ours close. We've got to make sure that we're doing the will of God and not our own will. So Samuel left. He was very upset, very upset with um, Saul, very upset. Um, then it goes on in the end of chapter 13 to talk about how Israel had no weapons uh, because the, the Philistines had them so under siege um, that they could not even um, make weapons in their camp anymore and if they wanted a weapon uh, not a weapon but if they wanted a farming tool that they had sharpened they had to actually go to the Philistine because there were no blacksmiths um, in Israel at all that could be used as blacksmiths because they had shut that down like no we're not gonna have y'all making swords so the only one that had swords were the actual king and the king's men um so, um, chapter 14 opens up with the bravery of Jonathan again. So, Jonathan is brave. Basically, Jonathan, like, I don't know why we just sitting around here doing it. You know what? He told his servant, let's go and see what's happening, right? Um, and his servant is like, whatever you want to do in your heart, I'm right there with you, right? That's a good servant. He's like, whatever you want to do, I'm following you. Just, just whatever you want to do. And so, they go, and Jonathan actually has this plan, like, you know, if they say they're going to come down to us, then that's probably not God. But if they tell us to come up to them, 
then that's God. And we know that that's God telling us that he's going to give uh, them to us, right? And so when they get there, um, the Philistines ask them to come up. Come up here so I can beat you down, right? Um, and what happens when they get up top, the Bible says that um, they went to town on um, that band of Philistines and killed 20 of them. Just um, Jonathan and the armor bearer killed 20 men. Uh, but it caused such a terror. And I, let me read this one scripture. I forgot. Um, verse 6 and 7. No, just verse 6 says, Jonathan said to his young armor bearer, Come, let's go over to the outpost of those uncircumcised men. Perhaps the Lord will act in our behalf. This is the uh, sentence I wanted. Nothing can hinder the Lord from saving, whether by many or by few. That was a lot of faith right there. Jonathan is a man of faith. He's like, look, if the Lord want to save, nothing's, it, the fact that it's only two of us is not going to keep the Lord from saving, right? Nothing shall hinder the Lord from saving, whether by few or by many. I'm telling you, that is awesome. You should put that just, it's not the memory verse I chose, but you should definitely put that one in your memory. Um, because we use excuses like it's only me, right? It's only me. And the next time you get that only me spirit coming over you, you should be able to speak to your heart and say um, that nothing can hinder the Lord from saving, whether by many or by few. And so they actually go up, they take the 20 men, uh, come back down. They don't even tell Saul what they have done. Um, but in the meantime, God has called fear to to go over the entire land of the Philistines. They think uh, some great, uh, you know, warriors have come to take them out. Um, and verse 15 says, Then panic struck the whole army, those in the camp and field, and those in the outposts and raiding parties. And the ground shook. It was a panic sent by God. And so the, the Israelites who are watching all this are like, what's going on? Uh, can you imagine the Philistines just all of a sudden running around, uh, killing each other with the sword? And it's like, what? So finally Saul wakes up and is like, you know what? We need to bring the ark out and ask the Lord if we should go up. And so he brings the ark to ask the Lord if he should go up and fight. But the Lord doesn't say anything. So he's like, why isn't the Lord saying something? I need to know. So then he figures out. Uh, rather quickly, it must be some sin in the camp somewhere. So he tries to figure out where the sin is. They use the, the ermine and the thumbing to find out where the sin in the camp is. And lo and behold, before they do this, he says, anybody who uh, has sinned and caused this sin, I'm going to put him to death, right? Even if it's my son, right? And guess what? It was his son because Jonathan had went against his father who had called a fast. Um, in the middle of a war, he not letting the men eat. That's not very wise, right? Uh, but for some reason, Jonathan probably was up fighting these 20 men when his father was telling the rest of the men that they couldn't eat. When he came down, he didn't notice. He saw honey on the ground and he ate the honey, right? But because Saul had said don't and he did, it was sin in the camp, disobedience to the king, right? Um, and so he, you know, Saul was going to carry it out. He's about to kill his son. Um, and now he want to be super obedient, right? He's about to kill his son, but the men talk him out of it. It's like, because of Jonathan that we just want, you know, that we're, that we're even here where we are. Why would we kill Jonathan? And so he talks him out of it. Um, and then, um, finally, if we go over to, uh, uh, chapter 15, um, it talks about the Amalekites and how the Lord tells uh, Saul to kill the Amalekites. And if you remember way back in Exodus, way back in Exodus, and I, and I try to get you to uh, remember what you're supposed to remember by saying, we're going to come back to this. So way back in Exodus, the Amalekites attacked the Israelites when they were just coming out of Egypt, right? And the Amalekites attacked them at their weakest point. They were just coming out of Egypt. They ain't know nothing about war, fighting, nothing. They've been slaves for 400 years. They don't know anything about weapons, fighting, nothing. And the Amalekites attacked them. Um, and the Lord told Moses that there was going to come a time when um, he was going to totally and utterly 
wipe out the Amalekites because of this, right? Well, here comes the time. He tells Samuel um, to tell Saul, um, you about to wipe off all the Amalekites because of what they did like over 400 years ago. God, first of all, time is nothing to God. Time is for us. So, so time is nothing to God. A day is like a thousand years, right? And a thousand years is like a day. Uh, but it had been 400 years. And I'm sure some of these Amalekites were like, what? We did what? But they never repented. You could tell that because of the relationship they never had with the Israelites. So they never repented, said they were sorry, tried to come and make peace with Israel after this. Um, they were still in turmoil with Israel. And God says, you know what? That's enough. We're about to do it right here. But Saul doesn't do what he's told. He is told to wipe out everything, like everything, like everything, kill it, everything. Man, woman, boy, child, doesn't matter. Kill the cattle, kill the sheep, kill everything. Kill everything that the Amalekites got. I don't want nothing to live. But what does Saul do? He keeps the king and he keeps the spoils, like the good spoils. If it was like good, you know, uh, livestock, he kept it, right? Um, and... You know, Samuel is like, I'm sure by this time, like, mm -mm -mm. by this time, God is saying, I have just, I'm just so sorry that I even chose Saul in the first place, right? Because Saul is just messing up. And so in verse 10, um, it says, then the word of the Lord, I'm in chapter 15, verse 10. Then the word of the Lord came to Samuel. I regret that I have made Saul king because he has turned away from me and has not carried out my instructions. Samuel was angry and he cried out to the Lord all that night. Early in the morning, Samuel got up and went to meet Saul, but he was told Saul has just gone to Carmel. There he has set up a monument in his own honor and has turned and gone on down to Gilgad. So you see, Saul was getting beside himself. Remember, he was this little farm boy that didn't even want to be king. Y'all remember that? He was running and hiding when Saul, when Samuel was trying to anoint him. They couldn't even find him. Now, all of a sudden, he's making monuments to himself, right? Um, looks like I'm offline. What's happening? Okay, I think I'm back online now. Sorry about that, guys. It looks like I am freezing a little bit. So, I don't know why, but hopefully I'll stop freezing. Um, but now he's making monuments. Oh my gosh. It looks like I'm frozen again. <sighs> goodness, goodness, goodness. But now he's making monuments to himself. Um, I think we're back on now. I'm sorry. It looks like I froze a couple of times there. So I'm sorry about that. But I was saying, remember this little farm boy who was so afraid, and now he's making monuments to himself, right? Um, so then it says, when Samuel, verse 13, reached him, Saul said, the Lord bless you. I have carried out the Lord's instructions, right? You know how a liar tried to like feed you that lie real quick so you'll believe it? That was Sam, that was uh, Saul right now. It's like, the Lord bless you, Samuel. I've done everything that the Lord said to do, right? And then Samuel said, and I love this line, he said, what then is this bleating of sheep in my ears? What is this lowing of cattle that I hear? In other words, if you did everything I said, why do you have livestock in the background, right? Why are they your background singers right now, right? Um, but Saul's like, Oh, we kept the best of the animals so we could sacrifice them to the Lord. So, I mean, that's crazy, right? We disobeyed God so we could bless God. It doesn't even make sense, does it, right? We didn't kill everything then because we want to kill them now and give them to God. It, it, it just don't even make sense, right? And so uh, Samuel was like, well, no, not only that, you kept the king alive. Um, enough. I don't even want to hear the rest of what you got to say because you got all these excuses that don't make any sense. Um, and so this is what he says. He says in verse 16, enough, Samuel said to Saul, let me tell you what the Lord said to me last night. And so tell me, Saul replies, Samuel said, although you were once small in your own eyes, did you not become the head of the tribes of Israel? The Lord anointed you king 
over Israel, and he sent you on a mission saying, go and completely destroy those wicked people, the Amalekites. God been planning this for hundreds of years. Hundreds of years he been planning this. Go and destroy the Amalekites, right? Wage war against them until you have wiped them out. Why did you pounce on the plunder and do evil in the eyes of the Lord, right? Um, so this was amazing to me, right? Uh, Saul's still talking. He like, but I did obey the Lord. I did do what he said, right? Um, and then he blames it all on the soldiers. See, I was keeping God's word, but the soldiers wanted some plunder. And I was like, you know what? If them animals good, just bring them on over here and we're going to sacrifice them to the Lord, right? Um, but Samuel replied, verse 22, does the Lord delight in burnt offering and sacrifices as much as in obeying the Lord? To obey is better than sacrifice and to heed is better than than the fat of rams. Now we've all heard that scripture to obey is better than say. obedience is better than sacrifice. And that's where this scripture comes from. God is saying, look, I told you what to do. Don't be telling me that you're trying to bless me and you not doing what I said, right? And then you want to turn around and say, well, Lord, the only reason why I played the lottery is because I was going to pay my tax. No, 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 no. Obedience is better than sacrifice. Well, Lord, you know, as soon as I had made the money on this crooked deal, I was going to, no, 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 no. Obedience is better than sacrifice. Well, Lord, you know, once we married, I was going to get him to come to church. Obedience is better than sacrifice, right? Um, it is much better to obey and God would much rather you obey then in, in hindsight try to offer him some offering that you think is going to be some uh, obeisance to him uh, in, in the long run no it is better for you to be obedient and then verse 23 uh, which is not often read i used to preach it a lot though back in the day for rebellion is like the sin of divination um, the King James says rebellion is like the sin of witchcraft, right? And I talked about how there were witches in the church. I preached that sermon before. Lots of witches in the church. And you got to say it slowly so you don't mess up, especially if you come from the world like me. Praise the Lord, right? Um, but yes, rebellion is like the sin of witchcraft or the sin of divination. In other words, um, um, you are trying to get your own way. And so um, you are devising things to work out in your favor and in your honor uh, rather than doing what the Lord says, right? And then finally, Samuel says, because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has rejected you as king. And so Saul, although this won't play out till many years later, um, has been rejected as king based on this right here. Already, the Lord had already started looking. Remember when he disobeyed the first time, um, the Lord had already started looking for a man after his own heart. But this put the icing or the nail in the coffin would be a better way to say it. This put the nail in the coffin like, you know what? I, you, you're not the king anymore in my eye. You, might, you may walk out the road for a little while longer, but yeah, my spirit on you is over. Um, and that's a scary thing because a lot of Christians are walking out the road, but God's spirit has been taken from them. Uh-oh. Mm, just think about it, right? They might still have the title, but the anointing is no longer upon them. They may still operate in the role, but the anointing is no longer upon them. We have to make sure that we walk in obedience so that the spirit of the Lord is not removed from us and we don't even realize it because we still doing the same things ritualistically. And so um, Saul finally comes to his senses and admits his sin and says, I just did it because the people wanted it done, but it was far too late by then the spirit of God had already been taken from him um, and saw even in his repentance um, and crying out to the Lord 
um, um, still was only doing it to save face, y'all. Look at verse 30. Saul replied, I have sinned, but please honor me before the elders of my people and before Israel. Come back with me so that I may worship the Lord. In other words, okay, okay, okay. I've sinned, but can you still go back with me to Israel so everybody don't know I'm sinning, right? It still cover me, right? I sinned, but I still want to look tall. I mean, I just built this 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 whole monument to me, right? So, I mean, you know, no need to tell the people that I sinned. Basically, he's saying, Saul, if, if Samuel, if you come back with me, then the people won't even know what went down. He's still trying to save face. He's still not the man after God's heart. He's still the man after a name for himself. So, um, Samuel is like, whatever. Yeah, whatever. Don't matter to me, right? Um, in the meantime, when Samuel went back, he said, let's take care of this right now. Where that king at? So Samuel brings the king, at, king out and kills the king himself. Um, and then it says that Samuel left that day and he never came back and visited Saul ever again. Still prayed for him, still called out his name, but he never saw Saul again after that day because he was done. God said, it's over and so Samuel is like, no need for me to come keep prophesying to something that the Lord has already called over. I mean, some prophets ought to take that into consideration, right? He said, it's, it's a wrap on that. Um, and so this was, oh, so many points. This video got to be longer than I thought it would be. Um, but there were so many points to be made um, in these five chapters. We're going to continue on tomorrow reading verses 16 through 20. We're going to talk about David and how David plays a role. Um, so we will talk about David. We will talk about his harp. We will talk about um, some of his conquests. We will talk about him and Goliath um, a lot. Tomorrow's video is probably going to be long too because there's so much to talk about. Uh, we're going to talk about um, Saul trying to kill David and David and Saul's daughter and Jonathan and all of that. We're going to be talking about a whole lot, um, but David will enter the picture. So be prepared tomorrow. But until then, you be blessed and know that I love you and God loves you too. In Jesus name. Amen.